to start telling you a little bit about me to give you some context, then we're going to jump into it. Uh, I'm Gen Y, therefore I've been raised to think that I'm an expert in everything, especially Gen Y. So, <laughs> some kindred spirits. I'm not Gen Y, I'm too old, but this one. Dobbing each other in, fantastic. Uh, I'm also the general manager of New Zealand's busiest theatre. We do about 400 performances a year in one theatre. If you do the sums on that, that's, uh, we actually are only open five days a week, so that's up to four performances a day. Uh, we're about to get a second space, so we're pretty excited about that. And I'm also a board member of Arts Wellington, which is an art advocacy uh, networking and training organisation. We've got about 300 members in Wellington. So I can see both sides of the coin. Just a little quick note, I am a POM who's lived in New Zealand for most of my life. So if I start to use words that don't make any sense, just pop up your hands and uh, let me know. You guys have an amazing word. and. Um, are there any Hamish and Andy fans in the room? <gasps> yeah, okay. So I have, to, I have to podcast that because I live in New Zealand. But uh, they open every uh, every per weekly show with a, a clip from a, a newscaster, I think, recently died, didn't he? Peter. Uh, Brian Henderson. Brian, maybe? No, and he, he uses a word called scary. That's an amazing word. Somebody used it yesterday at the CEO's day, and I was very excited to hear it being used. So uh, you also talk about weird things like packages and, you know, NCIS. And, so I, I try to stick away from anything that's too context specific, but if I do verge, let me know. Give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to meet Gen Y, learn a little bit about them, uh, question some of the assumptions about them. Next, we're going to talk about Gen Y on boards, how you get them onto boards, why you might want them on boards, what value they bring, and what it is they do. Uh, what it is they do want out of that board relationship. And thirdly, we're going to talk about Gen Y CEOs. Does anybody in the room have a Gen Y CEO yet? They are coming. They are coming soon. Uh, they are on their way up the organisation, and you're going to have some interesting challenges when they reach the top. I know, because I cause those problems for my board. Uh, we're, we're also a group who are known variously as millennials, digital natives, uh, and a host of other names that authors have made up to try and sell you all books. So the problem with Gen Y, as everybody knows, is that they're the youth. And I was at a, a seminar uh, for the New Zealand Charities Commission about a year ago, and there was a guy sitting in the corner. And we are talking about volunteers. And um, he goes, oh, the youth these days, they don't want to help. We can't find anybody to volunteer. They, they don't want to do anything. And about five of us in the room sort of quietly piped up and went, well, actually, we have no problem. We have more volunteers than we can do with, we have no problems with donations. And the real problem he was facing was, not to be too personal, but him as an individual, his attitude, and his organisation. They were obviously not working in a way that made Generation Y feel that their input would be valued. So as much of this general presentation, much as this presentation is about Generation Y, it's also about you. It's about being the sort of organisation that Gen Ys want to engage with. So, with a little bit of tongue in cheek, uh, let's meet them and hear a little bit about them. Not a goal that 
fits well with most nonprofit organizations. You don't generally end up being the richest person in the room. Uh, in fact, 81% of Generation Y report that this is their number one priority in life. Number two. <laughs> is we want to be famous. 51% of respondents suggested that. And again, this is not something that's necessarily encouraged in the not-for-profit sector. We're all quite, uh, you know, we're often kind of keep our heads down, do the job sort of people, and we don't necessarily reward uh, in the same way that we could, or that Generation Y might want to be rewarded and recognised. So not only do we have big dreams, but we back ourselves as well. I promise that's the only bit of PowerPoint animation. I couldn't, I couldn't resist that. Uh, 80% of people aged between 18 and 30 believe that they are very important. <coughs> very important. <laughs> uh, in contrast... Believe or are important? <laughs> it's, it's a perception for people outside Gen Y. It's a reality for those of us for a comparison, uh, in 1950, only 12% of people would have said the same thing about themselves. And that's the same stage of life we're talking. So this isn't just a kind of young people think they're the best. This is actually a real change in self-confidence, self-perception, and desire to have that recognised externally. So that's the depressing side of Gen Y. That was it. That's it. It's, it's happened from here on in. Uh, there are some things that can make us a bit optimistic. 96% will believe that they'll do something great. Now, the survey wasn't clear whether that might mean become famous on YouTube, uh, or whether it means actually do something meaningful. And, and not that you know becoming Justin Bieber isn't meaningful for Justin Bieber, but uh, this this is something that people can do in the not-for-profit world. They can have a feeling that what they're doing is is great. So. Uh, this is a, an excerpt I stole from news.com.au. I have no idea what, is that a popular site for you guys? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah? Okay. So, this was a very angry Generation Y person uh, talking about Generation X. But it, it's kind of apt. Uh, the, quote, <laughs> the quote is, we don't actually expect everything to be handed to us, except the keys to the world, because mm -hmm. we do a better job and then we find a new one in three months' time. <laughs> <laughs> we are optimistic. And we're really happy. And that's not a bad thing. It's something that you can tap into. 42% of people who work full-time in this age group report being happy with their lives. Oh, that's it. It's the full-time work. That's yeah, the that's the secret. Uh, the secret is also being under 30, because if you ask Gen X and Baby Boomers the same response, you get a much more depressing answer. <laughs> Only 27% of Gen Xers say that they're happy with their lives, very happy with their lives and only 29% of baby boomers. So there's a real optimism in this uh, group that you can tap into when you're trying to recruit and move forward or you're trying to create leadership positions. But that's yes, right. as of now, isn't it? Uh, it was as of when the survey was done, which I think was two years ago. Yeah, so right. is there a follow-up survey to see what they're To see whether they get more depressed as they get older? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there isn't. Okay. Um, well, to hang on to yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about future down the track, but that is that is a balancing act. We'll you know we'll talk a little bit about that, whether these things are true characteristics or whether they're characteristics of young people, yeah. uh, and in some cases they are, and in some cases they're not. We're also I'm not going to say smartest, but we are the best educated. Uh, like this is a U.S. stat, but from my kind of anecdotal research, I think it's fairly true, probably for Australia and New Zealand. Sixty-five percent of us have college degrees. A lot of us plan on or are already in uh, our second tertiary degree. Uh, so, for example, I'm doing my master's degree. I could probably pen, probably say 10% of the people in my course are Gen Y, and the rest are probably kind of 40 to 60. Mm -hmm. And we are a gener generation that wants to make the world a better place. We recognise the mess that the world is in, and we feel that it's our responsibility to make it better. As you can see, 61%. percent we want to get rich and famous, do you? <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think social enterprise is suddenly so popular? <laughs> because we want to save the world, and we want to get rich, and we want to be famous. So if we can do all three of those at once, that's... Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a triple win. Yeah? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, why get, I'm going to do one of those three. <laughs> so, contrary to my friend in New Zealand, we are very generous with our time. 81% of us have volunteered in the last year. At Bats Theatre, we have volunteers in the theatre five nights a week for four hours a night um, across 48 weeks of the year. And we never struggle to find people. To be fair, we give them a free show in exchange. You know, it's not a turn up and, you know, dig by the road in the hot sun. It's a fairly pleasant volunteering experience. But, uh, you know, we see that trend whenever organisations are positioning themselves in a way that Gen Y are being appealed to, they are seeing the volunteer hours. And again, really great news for not, not for profits. We are really keen to help other people. And as leaders of non profits, this next statistic should fill your heart with optimism. 79% of us want to work for a company that cares about how it, contribu how it contributes or affects society. So that right there is your pitch. That's your pitch to board members. That's the pitch if you want to recruit a CEO from outside the not-for-profit area who you've got your eye on. This is what will tap into their needs. Uh, I want to play you a little video to give you some context around the world that Gen Y have grown up in. I didn't have time to create my own little snippet. <laughs> Uh, so this was made by a 16-year-old in the UK, but he's done a really good job. Uh, but it is UK focused, so you know when when you see politicians up there, just sort of replace them with the relevant Australian politician in your mind. Mrs. Thatcher's years of power are over. She resigns to make way for a conservative leader more likely to win the next election. To give you sort of a quick rundown, hopefully you recognise a lot of the things that are going on there. Every generation grows up in a time of change, but the time of change for Gen Y has been massive. You know, when I was born, uh, you didn't have computers at home. Uh, by the time I was 10, you know, Dad was, you know, bringing a computer up to home. By the time I was a teenager, I had a cell phone. By the time I was in my mid-20s, I had a computer with the internet in my pocket. So 
that, that growth, that change, huge scientific change, huge uh, periods of consistent unrest. Other generations have grown up, you know, with the Vietnam War, and I'm now plagiarizing later part of my speech, so I'm going to stop talking about the Vietnam War, but, um, you know, we're talking about political scandals, uh, war, financial problems, and obviously the ever-growing threat of global warming, which we blame all the old people for. <laughs> so most of us grew up in the Clinton era. We entered out of hunt during the second Bush presidency, and this has greatly affected our worldview. We have really got used to diverse lifestyles and cultures. We grew up with them at school, and we learned to respect differences at a very early age. We're very comfortable with diversity. One third of us are a member of a minority group. And again, that's a US statistic, but I think generally you're seeing that trend worldwide. One of the consequences of uh, the world of computers and technology that we've grown up with is that we do have short attention spans. It's not just a rumor. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, as an example, you've got somebody multitasking just behind you, so I'm, at least I'm focusing. Uh, we do strive to work better and more efficiently, and we value professional development really highly. We love creative challenges, but we need ownership of our tasks. And we value jobs with flexibility, telecommuting options, the ability to work part-time or to leave the workforce temporarily when having children. We're also incredibly connected. Now, I mostly chose this slide because it's so beautiful. Uh, but what this shows is the flow of information around the world. Now, probably, you know, 50 years ago, there'd be, you know, one line from the UK to India and, and the rest of their uh, provinces, but, you know, nothing like this. What I think is also quite interesting is the gaps on the map. It's not really relevant to the presentation, but you guys got big hole in the middle here, right? Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of China, Russia, Africa. I cut off the US because I wanted to include New Zealand. And then I turned <laughs> up. And typical, bloody Australians, you cropped, cropped it off. <laughs> It is. I think that's, that treaty's almost done, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about how you might identify and recruit Gen Y into your board, because that's going to be a concern for some of you, especially talking to some people around the room where they're kind of like, yeah, the youngest person on our board would be... I don't think we've got anybody who's not retired. <laughs> uh, so... Do I need to explain why it's a good idea to recruit Gen Y, or can I assume that you're here because you at least think it's a good idea? Yeah, we can see. Oh, just yeah. giving the highlight, because I actually okay. have had people say to me, you know, you shouldn't right. have young people on the board, or you don't need young people. Yeah. Because I kind of disagree with that, so I'd like to hear some of those kind of highlights. Okay. Okay. It's money so, to get them here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the key thing is, it's about diversity. You know, you wouldn't say, we don't want any women on our board, we don't, we don't women don't bring any benefit to our board. You wouldn't say, we don't want any pe anybody from a, a marginalised community that we serve on our board. Mm -hmm. So especially if you have a, a youth-relevant program, it's really important to get them involved in your board. And apart from that, they bring a diversity of thinking. You know, as some of those slides earlier show, it's about the diversity of experience we've had and brought to us. It's also about a way of thinking and communicating. So we've been raised in a digital world we do think differently. You know, even my niece, who's five or six, thinks differently than me because she's had iPads since she was, you know, old, old enough to use them. And, and, you know, she doesn't understand why things don't work when you swipe at them like this on the screen. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, uh, and the other point, which I sort of touched on before, is they probably are your stakeholders. Uh, whether you run an aged care facility or you work with disadvantaged youth, they are informing decisions that are made that relate to your stakeholders. So let's look a little bit about why, uh, let's look about how you might recruit them, if, if that hopefully will go some way to answering your question. I'm happy to talk more about that afterwards. Firstly, you're gonna need to take a proactive approach. Uh, there's a real sense in Gen Y that boards are this thing that old people do, you know, or that you get invited you know, once you reach a certain stage, you, you become, you know, you get the, the knock, the secret uh, handshake to join the board club. Uh, but there are, there are quite a few reasons why they might be afraid to ask to join your board. Uh, it might be shyness, lack of confidence, although, you know, 
that's not always a problem with Gen Y. Uh, or, or simply the impression the boards are for old people. The other barrier I hear people say is that they do assume it's a closed club, that you need to be invited in, and that it's not just the sort of thing you ask to do. So I've taken a fairly proactive approach to my visibility in the sector, and that's how I got my first board appointment. I was shoulder tapped. I had a fire that system of closed secret doors. Uh, but you may need to seek out Gen Y people to join your board. Here's a quote from an interview subject on why they haven't tried to get a board appointment. I've heard that being on a board can be a huge time strain, which is a concern. As I've never sat on a board, I also worry that despite my education, I may still be underqualified. So if you're looking to recruit Gen Y board members, don't be secretive about it. Shout it from the rooftops. Try and get them to come to you first because they are out there and they are keen to be engaged. So if you do have to go out and find Gen Y board members, where do you go looking? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. Social media, Facebook, uh, depending on how strong a following you have, you can go out to those sorts of relationships and, and work on them. You can do quite targeted searches on things like LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not sure if you can do an age-based search. No. Okay. Just a lot of clicking through photos and making assumptions about people's age. <laughs> <laughs> Um, co-working communities, co-working yep. spaces have a lot of talent um, in their young people yep. and, and those young people are looking for board experience. Are people familiar with what co-working spaces are? Mm. I got some really mixed noises no, there. No, <laughs> so no, some people no. living, okay. Co-working spaces are often uh, sort of focused on small one or two member companies. Uh, they tend to be young, general, often technology or creative based companies. Uh, in the art sectors or digital sectors, and uh, I don't know of any examples in, in Melbourne. There's one in Richmond. Okay, there's one in Richmond. Inspire Nine in Richmond, Hub Melbourne. Yeah. 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 It's quite so fun. often you'll find things like social entrepreneurship businesses in there as well. So uh, they, the easiest way to approach them would be to talk to the management. They often have a person who is responsible for managing the space, and it's just a shared working environment. Essentially, you you hire a desk within the space. Uh, your volunteers are a great way. Either you might already have some Gen Y volunteers or children of your Gen Y volunteers if you don't have Gen Y volunteers. Uh, social media engagement we've talked about. People who are engaging with your website. Uh, you know, it can be as easy as putting up information about how nomination, the nomination process works or uh, how people get onto your board. And by making it transparent, you make it much easier for people to understand that process. And finally, just ask around. Uh, you've got Volunteer Australia over here, we've got Volunteer New Zealand. They're both organisations focused on connecting you with volunteers. So, it's a pleasure. Can you just step back for a moment? Yep. Um, in the first bit, should you actually have a um, strategy? Because uh, I mean, I chair a board and I'm the youngest group. Um, and the problem I've had, and you probably have as well, is the question was asked of the resistance you get from older directors is they're not going to stick around long enough. They're not going to be reliable and, and yep. committed because they are genuine. They're probably right. Yeah, so what um, I'm saying is I, sh I should have a strategy of actually yeah. conditioning the expectations of my other directors that they're not going to stick around for 10 years anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, it is around structuring those expectations, but it's also about who you're choosing and, yeah. and their connection. So, you know, the, the deeper connection somebody has with the organisation, yeah. the more reliable. Whether you get, is it worth getting two years of experience out of them? Or the energy, energy. Can be a, yeah. Also, yeah. the energy and you know the yeah. 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 Well, one, one of the things I would argue yeah. is yeah. is that Gen Y do bring that sort of innovation, that energy, that that yeah, yeah the way you do, you know, <laughs> they do, they do. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it isn't going to be a problem if they're only there for two years. Yeah, you know, there is always that lead in time, and you have to think about succession planning and how. You know, you're going to cope with the fact that it's going to take them six months to get up to speed of their two year term. I think it's really important to be realistic when you sell Gen Y on joining your board, <laughs> and time commitment is, is part of that. So it, it's also vital that they understand the risk of being a board member. Uh, I think a lot of organisations don't make that clear enough to people. So they need to understand that there are potential legal implications if things do go wrong. And you need to be clear on what the time commitment is, and, and that feeds into a kind of term commitment as well. 
So that you both go into the relationship with the same expectations. It makes, for example, it makes a really big difference whether you meet fortnightly or annually. And don't undersell the commitment required, otherwise you're going to end up with uncommitted people. And as with any board recruitment process, your desire to recruit Gen Y should come out of a proper gap analysis process. You know, it's easy to just kind of go, yeah, it's one of those young people and, and then not actually understand why you brought that young person on board. And again, that gap analysis process will help selling it to your other board members. And on a side note, this might actually be a great opportunity to sit down with your whole board and look at a job description for board members. It's going to help you clearly identify what it is you're looking for from new generation Y board members. And it's going to help get everybody on your board to recommit. And if people don't recommit, kick them out. Gen Y aren't going to be a band-aid on a dysfunctional board. If you've got toxic board members, you need to get rid of them first because Gen Y aren't going to stick around if they don't feel like they're making a difference, if they're just banging their head against a brick wall. So once you're ready to get Gen Y involved, it's important to start thinking about the role you want them to perform, about that job description. And there's no, dis there's no kind of negative connotation of that. It's, it's really important that you're both clear on the relationship. So here's a quote from somebody responding to a, a survey on, on Gen Y professionals. Gen Y professionals often seek board appointments not for the recognition, but for the altruistic value. To recruit a Gen Y board member, focus on the impact the service will have on their community, not on who they will network with or the power they will have. That's a recruiting pitch for a boomer. I personally would disagree with that. I think it's important to recognize that while we are looking to save the world, we are looking for that altruistic <coughs> value, we are also incredibly conscious of our desire to move upwards in the world. So impact is absolutely important, but you know, I'm on a board because it's a, benef a benefit to my community, it helps me grow the industry I'm in. Uh, but it's also, if I'm honest, it's about who else is on that board and how it looks on my CV when I want to progress to other roles. <coughs> so research does show that Gen Y value their time incredibly highly. We don't want to waste it, so make sure that your meetings are well structured and make really good use of time. Gen Y board members are less likely to be interested in the gossip and more interested in the action. And gossip is something that a lot of... Really? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what the research says. And there's always exceptions to the research. I'm the outlier. Thank you yeah. for <laughs> um, You also might want to choose to mix it up a little bit. So every meeting doesn't have to be in a boardroom with wood panelling. If any of you have got wood panelling in your boardrooms, I'm very jealous. <laughs> if you've got a boardroom table, I'm quite jealous. Um, <laughs> We have, we, have a, we, have, we have a corner of our office that used to be a bar. Uh, why not ask Gen Y to organise a meeting for you and see what happens? Uh, see how they run things differently. It's an experiment. I'm not saying it's going to work. It's an experiment, but you'll learn a, you'll learn a lot from that process. If you really want to get them on your board, let them know that they're going to have a voice. Because that's often a concern of Gen Y coming on a board. For the more confident ones, they probably don't feel that. I'm guessing you didn't feel that going into your But you know, they, they want to know that their ideas will be help will help create solutions to challenges, and let them know that they're going to be working, hopefully, with other bright, positive people. Because you've already got rid of all the boring, depressed people earlier on in the process. Is there, is there a potential conflict? Because you quite well what you said about them being action orientated. So I find yeah. we have no choice getting these volunteers, but they all want to go and do the, the yeah, exactly. ban or whatever, you know, the delivery of the services directly or the youth outreach. But is there a problem in terms of the crossover between board and management in saying to them, we're not actually running the organisation in the day to day sense? And so I think that again comes down to making the relationship clear yeah. Yeah. up front, you know, about that position description and going, this isn't operational. Yeah. This is about strategy, it's about your your world view. It's not about managing stuff. And they want they probably won't want to manage the detail stuff because that's kind of boring. You know? <laughs> you know, get somebody else to do that. So it's an actor that does that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think the tricky thing there is that because they'll be coming up with ideas for what the organization how the organization can achieve its mission, 
in interesting and innovative ways that are compelling for the community in terms of story and that kind of thing. They're going to be quite good at doing things in that way. Yeah. They're going to want to get involved. <coughs> um, but, you know, as long as it's just getting involved is about telling their friends on Facebook to get involved and that kind of thing, if you keep them at that level, it should be okay. Yeah, it, it's, um, it, it will be a challenge. I mean, certainly on the board I, I'm on, uh, there is a certain amount of us having to dip in operationally because of the type of organisation it is. But uh, Gen Y are ideas generators and, and they will want to get involved. But it's about structuring that process and kind of saying, okay, you want to get involved. This is where we can get involved. You can write a strategy document or you can go out and achieve this goal for us. Uh, and, you know, writing for Gen Y can be as rewarding as going out on the streets, you know, for example. So, Have you had any social media incidents yourself? Yes. 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 I yeah. I, 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 I got in the, the national newspaper for a social. So you sort of. You sort of get carried, <laughs> 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 so so carried away and said, "No, we had a really great board meeting last week, and we decided we're going to put on five more new productions." And yeah. You tweeted that out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I. I. I won't give you the full story. It was not a. It was not a front page situation, but I, I tweeted something that was uh, operationally uh, for the related organisation, which we thought was. The newspaper didn't, and the party even less so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, I think, comes down to good governance structures around that. So I, I don't know how many boards have social media policies. My, neither of the boards I'm associated with do. Strong confidentiality um, stuff. Yeah. Uh, again, I'd encourage the, the prep stage, the kind of gap analysis, all of that is, again, and this is just good governance, but it's about reviewing you know, yourselves and your processes and your, your policies and all, all of those elements. But that is a real risk. I um, think it's a responsibility, though, in terms of the older directors, too. They, they, they can't just fall back on the defense. Well, we don't understand this social media. And you've got yeah. this young person out there tweeting away. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of my next point, which is don't just make them the social media girl. <laughs> uh, they, they've got a lot more to bring to the board table than just, yeah, look, we need somebody to do that social media stuff for us. Um, or, you know, we need somebody who understands the internet. It's everywhere. So I mentioned before about making them aware of the risks, and a great example of this is that you need to make sure, for example, that everybody understands financial statements. And this is kind of boring stuff. Yeah, um, um, this is something that's really close, dear, near and dear to my heart because I have to educate the board I report to that they are all legally reliable, um, all legally responsible for the financials. Uh, you know, if they don't understand it, they need to come to me and ask questions because it's not good enough for them to say, oh yeah, you know, John in the corner, he's the accountant. So things like that. Make sure you're getting the training they need. So it's great to see all of you here. You obviously support the idea of ongoing development and training. Make sure they're getting that as well. You know, the new stuff released by the SNC, <coughs> all of that kind of stuff, make them aware of it, make them an animation. Things that are really boring, um, but but don't assume they come with all the skills that they need, because the reality is they don't have the life experience of people who've been around for sixty years. They probably haven't run their own company. Uh, they probably haven't had the breadth of, of travel or despair or elation that people you know have who've, who've experienced a lot greater number of experiences through that time period. So. This is a quick summary. You don't need to take a photo because it'll be on the internet. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is just a little recap of what might appeal to Gen Y about being on a board. Firstly, there's advancement. So Gen Y are really keen to advance in their work. So it's about selling them the benefits that they're going to get on being a board. Uh, then there's networking, which is very closely tied in who they're going to talk to, who they're going to meet, and how that might affect <coughs> their future growth. Next is training. Not enough boards commit to training, so again, just to reiterate, make sure they're getting the training they need, uh, or you're insulating them from the things they need to be insulated from in, in a legal way uh, through the use of minutes and things like that. Just to make sure that they're not overstepping the boundaries. You know, give them a mentor who has been on the board for a significant number of years to help guide them through that process. And finally, focus on the outcomes of your work and how it makes a real difference. 
these four elements will help you recruit better board members. Next up, we're going to talk about managing Gen Y, because that is something that the boards are going to have to learn how to do <coughs> over the next 10 years. Have you picked up the theme yet for the images? Mm -hmm. I've tried to find as many Lego images as we went through. Oh, that would be creative them. Oh, that makes no, sense. if only I had the time. <laughs> if I had the time, that would be every single slide would be there. you're retro and you're going to Star Wars. So. Okay, yep. There, there is a little bit of Star Wars stuff going on too. Mainly because the guy who I collected most of these photos from is doing that. Uh, just, you know, Creative Commons images, if anybody would like the source. You should say that because it's a social media. Yep, <laughs> yep. Is this one that um, YouTube one where, where they get the tray and have No, but isn't that hilarious? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have quite a laugh at this. Will you post the picture on Facebook? Mm -hmm. I won't post the picture on Facebook, no. Oh, I'm sorry, because it belongs to somebody else. Um, <laughs> I don't have any glasses. <laughs> um, so what do you do when you end up with Generation Y reporting to your board? You need to go back to those key drivers. Number one is we value our time more than anything else in the world, without a doubt. We like it more than money, actually, the research shows. I gave up a job selling real estate to move into the not-for-profit sector. Uh, that was because I had no time to myself, and it was an unrewarding career to a job where I earn significantly less, but love what I do. We've talked about training on boards. Training for Generation Y employees is incredibly important as well. It's one of the things we value most highly in our jobs. And we'll take it over a fancy title, interestingly enough. closely connected to our focus on time, we love flexibility, and that's flexibility of time, flexibility of work, topic, location, environment, all of those things. And your neck. Yeah, and yeah. neck. Uh, we, we really, really dislike routine. And that's a preference, that's not a, that doesn't mean you have to not have a routine for them, you know, it, it's about finding something that works for both the organisation and the individual. So, I want to tell you a little story about uh, where he, he's actually a, a guy who writes on the topic of Gen Y, and he talks about his first job. He went in, it was an investment banking firm, he was going to be you know, making millions, he was on their training program, and in the first week, uh, he went in and was working on this report and, and handed it to the uh, general manager. The general manager turned around and went, yeah, great report, can you do the page numbers in green, please? because that's how we do things around here. You know, that's the sort of thing that will drive Gen Y up the wall, you know. Rules for the sake of rules. We just, we just don't do that. This guy walked out of the job. He gave it up. He said, no, that's not the kind of organisation I can work for. <laughs> so, you know, we're confident. You know? Well, we'll show sure. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know. Not easy to go back and do it Yeah, yeah. I, I can give you kind of a, a nice little recent example of this. I just turned down a job, and the reason was the organisation had a terrible training budget. Uh, I would have had to work for a much stricter schedule, a much bigger organisation, and it would have required me fitting into the structure of quite an inflexible organisation, even though they were going to pay me more than I'm getting now. So we, we will take time training and flexibility in the real world over money. I'm not going to give a prize because I don't have one. <laughs> but, oh, we've gone too far. Uh, easy guess. What, what do these numbers represent? How long the job for? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how long we're saying. So, uh, top is baby boomers. Next down is Gen X, and then Gen Y. Now, again, you have to take this within some context. Most, we're all Gen Y are currently below 30. So, there is naturally much higher turnover during that time period than there would be later on in life, but the evidence would point towards we're not going to hit that seven year mark. Uh, yes? And I, I just have a Gen Y pointing out that for a lot of us, it's not just it's not us sticking around and changing commitments, it's actually changing the job market. Yeah. We're on a two year contract. Yeah, yeah. 
Funds, yeah. funding yeah. that. That dirty F word. Funding your opportunities. And I, I, it's really interesting because people have this attitude mm. and then why I won't stick around. And I say, well, mm. are you going to give me a full-time permanent, mm. you know, guarantee of a job for life? And yeah. the organisation says, uh, 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 no, we can only give you a two-year contract. Yeah. And so I think it's those that attitude of the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. My, my grandfather worked for the electric company in Belfast for his whole, whole life. life. You know, you sell that idea to a Gen Y and they go, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> where's the variety? Where's the excitement? Where's the change? So uh, let, we'll, let's put a kind of a wait and see on this statistic. Let's, let's see what happens over the next 10 years. It's going to grow. I think it's going to sit closer to that five than it ever will, the seven. Uh, yeah. So what are the things that are going to help you retain your Gen Y CEO? Uh, while I've said that we uh, value time over money, we also believe we're worth far more than you think we're worth. <laughs> uh, so we, we will always feel that you should be paying us more. Uh, we also are really keen on benefits. So that's, I, I don't kind of know how the Australian market works, but things like health insurance, uh, retirement savings, contributions, those sorts of things are surprisingly valuable. And it's amazing, Gen Y are actually one of the few generations that are thinking right now about our retirement. And some of that. To be tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, want, I want to leave work at 50, so yeah. Yeah. 50? Oh, yeah. You want to stick around that long? <laughs> <laughs> My 30th birthday's coming up in a couple of months. I'm disappointed. I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it seems like adding a bit more to sort of small things that, that pile up and kind of go, yeah, okay, I'll take that rather than, than that. Opportunities. That's a really tough one once you hit CEO level because the only opportunity is to move somewhere else. So you've got to be really mindful of that. Um, if you're not the biggest player in town, your CEO is thinking about moving there. Or taking the other one over. Yeah, <laughs> that's an even better option. Um, so, so bear in mind that they will be looking at opportunities and, and you're going to kind of have to continuously actively keep them engaged and committed to your organisation. And interestingly enough, location comes in number four with, with Gen Y in this, in this survey. Uh, I think, you know, that's, that's everything from the environment to which they work uh, to, the, to the area they work. Uh, we're, we're far less keen on commuting. We don't want to have to travel to, you know, long distances in order to do it. And again, that's going to be reinforced by demographic changes, you know, increased city living and things like that. Yep. Can I make a suggestion, um, just in terms of the strategy of, I, I, I would maybe suggest not even bothering trying to retain, like worrying about whether or not you're providing the opportunities to retain that particular CEO, but actually have a conversation with them up front and say, you know, um, what's your exit, like help them mm. with the, pro mm. they're going to leave. Assume they're going to leave, yep. have the conversation up front, get them to help in their network identify mm -hmm. a possible replacement. You know, have an open handed yeah, exit successful. strategy yeah. and think about how you can create the conditions to attract talented CEOs in yeah. general. That's a really that's a really great point. I'm kind of doing exactly that in New Zealand at the moment with, with an organization working with the CEO and the chair to say, okay, you know, she's on a set contract. We're, you're both really clear that she's not going to stay on that, you know, past that. She's, you know, kind of a shining light. She's got you know, bigger and better things to go on to. So, you know, succession planning is, is really important, and whether that's internally or externally. Then there's kind of all the other things that they care about. Leadership, your reputation or your brand, in-house training programs, tuition reimbursement, given Gen Y's focus on ongoing training. It's actually a really strong one. Uh, but... Think about, you know, this kind of traditional model of that was, yep, you know, we'll pay for this, but then we're going to bond you for two years for the organisation. Work out how you're going to negotiate things like that because that's kind of a double-edged sword for Gen Y and you might end up with kind of an angry disagreement when they go, actually, I don't, no, thanks, but no, I'm done. Uh, and diversity, interestingly enough. Diversity of company staff ranks really highly. So to summarise those benefits, with a time clock of money. 
<laughs> if you can, you know, try and provide above average everything. That's kind of common sense, but focus on what it is that, that's going to reward them. And we'll kind of go over that in the next slide. But, uh, you know, Gen Y will always think they're worth more than you're paying them, but if you are paying them slightly more than the other guys would, then it's that much harder for them to leave. And especially if you're giving them those benefits like time off. The research shows that Gen Y will take a good offer today over a better one tomorrow. So you might kind of convince them, you know, sneak them in there. Uh, and we will sacrifice some salary if you give us more leeway on our time. You can be imaginative with your benefits as well. Motivation research indicates that non-monetary benefits are actually highly, uh, more highly valued than their cash equivalent. So, you know, that might be as simple as paying for a weekend away. That actually could be slightly more motivating than giving them a you know, $200 bonus, which they kind of go, yeah, well, $200, whatever. But, but a trip away, that sounds exciting. And, you know, if that trip away happens to be a luxury lodge training course, you might actually get away with um, ticking both the training and the benefits box. This is a summary of those uh, key benefits. Yeah, so devices. <laughs> I, yeah, I, you know, if somebody wanted me to give up my iPhone just to go work for them, that would be a really big conversation for me. You know, that would be like, you know, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of Apple computers. If they wanted me to work in a Windows office, that would be a big conversation. You know, in Windows office, yeah, in this office, we only use Windows. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you've got your benefits, your healthcare, vacation, retirement programs, bonuses, flexible work hours, and paid time off to attend professional development events like this. You're going to need to learn to communicate and why for your Generation Y CEOs. Now, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that Generation Y would rather talk than text? That might be a bit of a surprise, but it, it's true. Yep. If we want to have a, a conversation, you know, it's not like, you know, if we you know, meet you at the bar in 20 minutes, you know, then we'll text it. But, you know, in a work context, we'll actually, we're actually more likely to talk. Two thirds of survey respondents said that in person conversations with their co workers was their preferred communication yeah. method. And only one in five would rather communicate by email. You also need to learn how to support Gen Y, who've grown up with constant external validation. And this may be happening within your organization as well. That uh, you know, managers are, are learning that Gen Y can't live on a, on an annual tech, well, not annual, good lad, sort of uh, feedback process. They need it consistently. And it's not consistent praise, but it's consistent feedback. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to say, you know, this was, un, you know, this wasn't, didn't meet standards. They are interested in that. They want to know how they can improve themselves. But when you get to the relationship with a, between a board and a CEO, that's just simply not possible. So you need to think about how you're bringing people up through your organization if you are planning to succeed them internally and how you are going to wing them off that idea of consistently getting feedback. We are used to getting timely critiques about our performance. We seek managers who are willing to let us figure out our own strategies and allow us to own those strategies. We, we want that level of empowerment. So that works really well with that board CEO relationship. We're willing to be accountable for what we're doing and we're willing to generate those ideas. So think very carefully about that relationship between governance and management. And think about making sure that your board is approachable and you're available to provide assistance and support where necessary. According to a survey, I mean 10% of Gen Y are comfortable communicating only once a week with their bosses. So 90% of them want to talk to you every week. <coughs> now, in some board CEO relationships, that might be possible. It might be quite a close relationship. Uh, but it might be as simple as, you know, for example, with my board, we have kind of a no surprises policy. So, you know, rather than waiting for the next board meeting, I'm letting the board chair know that this is coming up or this problem, you know, is on the verge of becoming a bigger problem. And just, you know, simply a bounce back reply from that. It's vital, though, that you're going to set appropriate boundaries. You may need to teach them how to be that senior manager and how to live without that constant feedback. Uh, so try and, try and make that happen internally as they ascend. You're going to have to excuse the visual pun. I couldn't quite uh, <laughs> give that one up. Uh, coach don't manage. I think that's an important 
management principle anyway. It doesn't just apply to Generation Y, but it doesn't really apply to them. Generation Y would like an outside coach or mentor. Now, having somebody on the board is a good start, but try and encourage them or try and facilitate a connection for them that gives them that mentorship and that support, because then that starts to take up that slack of the board CEO relationship as well, where they can bounce ideas in a safe environment. We're gonna go back to time and balance. Um, 73% of Gen Y professionals are concerned about being able to balance a career with personal obligations. Now that's not new, I'm sure that's been the case for every generation, but we are especially vocal and especially demanding about flexible working hours. Uh, within my organisation, I'm technically not allowed to accrue time and load because the assumption is I'm at the top of the organisation, I do the number of hours that are required. But I have a relationship with my board which says, look, if I spend all of Saturday in a board, board strategy session, I want to take the next Friday off so I can have a long weekend. And that's the sort of relationship we have, and it's the sort of relationship you're going to have to learn to evolve. Because we're, we're much less likely, and there's always going to be outliers, but we're much less likely to be those 100 hour a week kind of Gen X, uh, kill ourselves working our way to the top. And balance isn't just about flexible working hours, though, it's about a sort of holistic for your expectations about your structure, your attitudes, and your culture, both at a board level and an organizational level. Some, it's an area that you're going to be sort of constantly negotiating with your CEO. So again, here's a little bit of a, a recap. These are the top reasons that Gen Y leave a role, and that's a lack of coaching, uh, better benefits elsewhere, better training elsewhere, uh, problems getting feedback from their managers, Opportunities, it's kind of a broad term for it just seems like it would be better. Uh, and pay. Uh, interestingly enough that this survey, in, in contrast to the previous one I talked about, did actually say that a more prestigious job title would, would, was one of the reasons cited for leaving. Uh, it was lower down the list, uh, but it is, it's a factor. Again, it, it's, if you've got somebody at CEO level, that's fine, but it could be a way that you can cherry pick out from another organisation. So, the unknown variable. <laughs> Many Gen Y, myself included, uh, are embarking on a journey of parenthood. And being a parent may actually amplify some of the key characteristics of Gen Y. The question is, will we become more demanding about flexible working? Or will we step back from that and go, actually, we need money, we need to raise a family, we need to be serious people. You know, we can't up. just, yeah, we need to just <laughs> grow up. Grow up. Um, so, you know, we're on the cusp of this. The, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I think it'll be an interesting thing to watch over the next 10 years. It may actually cause us to settle down and reduce our high turnover rates as we commit to being grown-ups. Uh, and, you know, as I'm rapidly learning, little people can be very expensive. So, Generation Y may be willing to sacrifice some of their other benefits for, for more cash in the bank. Ultimately, this threshold is going to radically alter our behaviour. We're just not sure how. And before we want to move to questions, we've got about seven minutes left. Actually, six minutes and four seconds. Uh, before we go on, uh, I want to show you a video. It's a little bit US-centric, uh, but trust me, it, it's valid for many of us in my generation. It really sums up how Gen Y feel about the world, uh, the world that we live in, and our desire to change it. Every generation has a, has a call to action or a crisis to solve. You know, there have been world wars, Vietnam wars, Great Depressions. It, it's not new uh, that, that young people want to change the world. There's, there's nothing surprising about that. But what is surprising is that now we live in a very globally connected world. Uh, we understand the world we live in. We see it visually, immediately, live. You know, last night on TV, live pictures of uh, you know, the, the square in Egypt where there are protesters you know, essentially being shot live on TV. Um, so, it's an incredibly exciting time to work in this sector. Uh, we are really passionate about making a difference. We want to make it a better place. Uh, so, get Gen Y on your board because we're desperate to help. I'm one. 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 I'm one.
For the past 40 years, the political and social agenda of the United States has been set by our parents, the baby boomers, who were the largest generation in America. Not anymore. A new generation, a new generation, is coming to power. They call us the millennials, but you can call us Generation Week. Generation Week. In 2016, the youngest of us can reach a voting age. Making us the largest generational voting bloc in the country. And we're unlike any that's come before us. We. We. We are more globally oriented. We're more ethnically diverse. We're more technologically adept. Better educated. Less politically partisan. And we're the first generation in American history to inherit a nation in decline. In decline. Our national debt is ten trillion dollars. That's thirty thousand dollars of debt. Thirty thousand dollars of debt for every man, woman, and child. Our educational system. Our educational system is failing. We have the highest child poverty rate in the developed world. Some of us are losing our homes. Our dependence on fossil fuels has polluted our environment. Our water is contaminated, and our health is endangered. Half of us. Half of us will get cancer. One in three will develop diabetes. Our lifespan is expected to be less, less, less than our parents. Even though they live in the world's wealthiest nation, Generation We are inheriting a damaged future and a set of potentially catastrophic problems. But we have every reason to be optimistic. These kids identify themselves as strongly progressive and are fed up with partisan politics. They're socially tolerant, environmentally conscious, and peace-loving. They volunteer in record numbers. They're technologically brilliant. And most importantly, they're politically engaged. They believe they can restore the American dream. Generation We is poised to lead the change we need. Our collective future depends on it. Now, will we listen to them? We. The youth of the United States. We, the youth of the United States, believe our birthright has been betrayed. Our inheritance has been squandered. We will not accept a cruel and unfair future of incomprehensible debt, punitive taxation, economic disparity, military conflict, chronic disease, and environmental disaster. We must restore and protect. We must restore and protect our environment and the planet. We must provide quality nutrition and health care for all of you. We must provide equality of education and learning resources for all people and economic classes. We must end the perception. We must end the perception that America is an arrogant, arrogant and greedy nation. We must vote. We must vote. We must vote in unprecedented numbers. And exert our political power to create a just and sustainable world. We are the largest demographic group in the United States, and once unified, we can control America's political landscape. This Millennial Declaration, this millennial declaration is a call to action. It is the beginning of a nationwide movement to restore our future, save our nation, and preserve our family. We're going to make history. We're going to make history. Will you join us? Will you join us? Will you join us? Will you join us? to you, uh, Spanish. Would you rather fight with us on your side or without us? Because you're a generation who recognizes the challenges ahead, or a generation who are passionate about making a difference. So it can make a real difference to your boards and your organizations.